So here today, we've kind of been a little guilty of telling the truth and kind of raw. But if you were, if, how do we reach out that somebody, that small business, because these YouTubes, there's a lot of small business that watches it. If you were to, maybe we switch this now and say, hey, what's, what's some things to look for from the practitioner view that would help that small business go, that makes sense. Well, I think what you're saying that maybe we can help with is, and we've probably all been in this situation where we told somebody you're not eligible. They hear the ad, they get suckered into the excitement of the money and all that. And then they come back to us and say, Hey, look, Kathy, I got $300,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I need you to amend my tax return because that's what the law requires. What do we do? Mm -hmm. We're, we're, huh. we're all, if you're not in that position today, you will be. You will be. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then it comes down to the first question, because we know there's a notice out there, but that notice says you're supposed to be, I'm going to use the term loosely, you're supposed to be proficient in the ERC. Well, a lot of practitioners, as I said earlier on this uh, presentation, was that a lot of tax professionals don't do tax returns. So the first decision is, do I have, according to that notice, do I have the skill set to do this return? Well, let's say I do. Then the question is, do I know enough or do where does the inquiry go of, do you qualify for the ERC? How for, what, what all do we have, what all information do we have together are we now going to redo to see if they qualify? So again, we, we're aware of ERC. So we've eliminated the practitioner that just says, hey, I can't do this because I don't understand ERC. You know, I don't do payroll. It's just out of mind. But now I understand it. One, I don't know whether this client qualifies or not because I didn't do it. And the other one is I do know and they don't qualify. Well, if they don't qualify, then and then I'll come back. You know, Kathy, go first, and Roger. What are you going to do in that situation as a practitioner? This is not authority. This is trying to survive life in the tax professional mm -hmm. world. Well, I have two good example, real life examples of clients of mine. So one is is a business that um, we did a sweep because we did get involved in ERC in, in our, in our, in my firm. So we did a sweep of clients to see who qualified in real time for the most part, as much as we could. So when I was going to do the 2022 tax return for this particular client, um, we do have on our due diligence questionnaire, did you apply for the ERC with another, you know, third party vendor? And they, they checked the box. Yes. And so we followed up and, and, um, so I challenged, I, I, I went back to the bookkeeper and I said, well, can you provide the documentation? Because, you know, when, when we did that, that ERC sweep, um, it, you didn't qualify. And so she went back to the person that did the ERC and he then sent an email um, and said that he was wrong, uh, somehow made an error in the calculation of gross receipts and no, they do not qualify. And so this client, so then I'm like, oh, well, that's kind of sad. So anyway, the client um, felt, I mean, he wanted to do, you know, he didn't want it if he didn't qualify, but, you know, so he paid it back. We just got done filing those 941X Amendment 2 um, to then take the ERC off the table and pay the money back. And and he was very, he was he was happy in doing that. He understood and and the and the and to the credit of the original preparer he he at least verified in an email that he had erroneously calculated it so there was that piece second client i have the situation it was that um large they got a large 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 erc they do not qualify i've run the, i've calculated it a couple times and so what do you do? This is a client that we've had for several years. Um, they're choosing, as Roger put it, that break point. They're cho choosing, you know, the large sum of money, um, just under 500000 And 
so <clears throat> I, you know, I mean, the trust, the trust has been broken on so many levels, right? Because we know they, we had the correspondence with them. We went through it again with them and then they still proceeded with it. And then they didn't tell us and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, we're probably, you know, we're, I'm going to have to let that client go. Um, <clears throat> and I say that, I mean, I, I'm in a fortunate position where we are turning down business all, all the time because we simply just don't have, have the, the, the resources to service more clients, but, you know, they're taking up the space of somebody that's looking for help and wanting, wanting to do things. So that, those are the two examples that I have, Larry, of how I have handled it. Um, very difficult situations though, in both scenarios. And we have two different mindsets of the, of, of clients as well. Um, what wasn't, what was interesting though, the first client, that preparer of the 941X did not sign as the paid preparer. There was no paid preparer signature on that. Wow. The only signature on that 941X was the small business owner. And same with the second one, although the paid preparer was on there, an attorney, not saying anything about that, but I don't think they're payroll people. But anyway, he, but those owners are signing off on that 941X when you do that. As a small business owner, you have to understand the liability you're taking, that you are signing that tax return and saying that you verify that information. And so when it comes to payback time, that's going to be very painful for some. Roger? Yeah, I think, and and I think your examples are pretty typical of the, mm -hmm. the two mm -hmm. big issues that we run into. And I think what frustrates me, and I'm going to speak to it a little differently, is sometimes and I'll speak here, the IRS takes too narrow an approach to, to, to things. We need to step back and look, using your two examples, the, the, what is, where is the tax system in the situation you're in? You're making a decision, you're going to keep one client, lose one client. Mm -hmm. The client you're going to lose is going to go down the street, they'll find somebody mm -hmm. who will amend the return mm -hmm. and move forward, and based on the laws of averages, has probably a 95% chance to never be questioned. So what damage was done to the overall tax system mm -hmm. by having that client leave you to try to do it right because you didn't have any tools to use to solve that problem other than to tell the client, knowing that client would end up somewhere else, get the result that they want, and a large probability they would get away from it. If the system is important to us, we need to empower people like you with the tools that you need to say, let me help you get in compliance. You don't qualify. I know it's not possible. You said just under a half million dollars. I don't know if they still have it or not. They certainly didn't get it all because at least 20 or 25% of it went somewhere else. Oh, for sure. Mm -hmm. We need tools. If we think doing it right matters, give the people who are doing it the right way, the tools and the education and the necessary to say, let me help you do it properly or you will get caught. Because if I can't do either of those two things, the system suffers because that business owner goes somewhere else, gets away with it, and it just continues to manifest that that happens time and time again. And then it comes back at some point, you're very fortunate. You don't need that client bad enough. You can replace it. There's a lot of people that's not an option. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, that person then has to say, well, I'll take the same risk you're willing to take. I'll just go forward with it just like you were eligible and because I can't survive otherwise. And that's not good for the system. So we have to empower the people who are trying to do it right with the necessary tools to be able to make doing it right the right thing to do and the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. We don't have those tools today. Right. And that's that's why earlier I went to irs.gov to say, how do I navigate? Right. There, there's nothing to navigate. But some of the tools we've looked at is, for example, uh, throwing out the idea of a soft letter. Um, mm -hmm. Why don't you put a soft letter to say, how did you qualify? Because, Roger, as you said earlier, they just put a number on there. Nobody knows where it came from. I don't know how you audit that. I don't know how you do all that. Uh, the other one would be a soft letter when they send the refund out, as a reminder, you need to amend the return because how many of these income tax returns are going to go unamended and they're going to get downstream and mm -hmm. then the IRS is going to be sending out notices that they were not amended and they're why not take care of that up front 
and put a soft letter in with the refund saying you need to go to your tax person and you know yourself or your tax person and get the income tax returns um, taken care of. Now, well, Larry, Larry, just to, just you might want to qualify what what when you say soft letter, what are you talking about? That's okay. from the IRS. All right. Well, the IRS has done soft letters like an offshore. They said you may have this, and if you voluntarily come forward, you're not going to hear from us again. They've done it in cryptocurrency to say if you come forward, we're, we're you won't hear from us again. So if you'll file this, you know, if you'll file this amended return you don't hear from us or here is things here's the tools you know if this was gross receipts check here if this was from a government mandate shut down for these reasons and put mandate and put some of the most common ones or other check here and send it back in what will happen is what ha that's a tool we can work with because they're going to come to who with that soft letter and they'll say Roger Kathy what does this mean we have an opportunity to explain at the time. The other thing, Roger Volgo, when you said in all the careers and uh, I've been around, you and I are in a race for how many years we've been around. Uh, and I don't know who's losing or winning and we won't go into I don't that. know what winning means in that race. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, back in, I, I'm going to go way back. In 1993, there was a flood in the Missouri Mississippi River. And there was some credits and money available. And there was fraud then. The interesting note is what they did is they used zip codes. So if you mailed in for this credit and the address of the business was not in a zip code that the flood was in, they sent you a letter. So what I'm saying is, is let's go to this. If you said, did you qualify by gross receipts? If it's no, then we're going to look at your zip code because the zip code I live in, you know, for six quarters, I'm not going to qualify because there was no mandate for at least five of those six quarters. Yeah. I mean, so my, they, I'm, I'm throwing out things that they have used in the past. Mm -hmm. This is not new. And a zip code is really a neat thought. I mean, think about it because they know whether a, a, a local city, county, borough, state, whatever, had a required mandate, and you can put that into, you know, a database mm -hmm. and say, this business and this address has a good likelihood that they may not have qualified unless it was through supply chain because of the supply chain and all those options. So that, I guess that's my big concern takeaway the, 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 some of this stuff up front could have been so easy and not something that 1993, they did it. That they We're in 23. That was 30 years ago, and they didn't have the computers of today. So, again, we're back to this. We IRS, please help us with tools. And all three of us have been reaching out for quite some time. And I think the other one they have to give us, and I've heard rumors that they're thinking about this, but it, the sooner the better. To your point, let's assume that they do soft letters or we convince them that we were right. You have to pay it back. Give us friendly ways. Give us something. If I come forward now, friendly payment terms, understand I didn't get 100 percent, but something that is suitable and acceptable to that business owner who finally realizes I I wasn't mm -hmm. entitled to it, but I don't have half a million dollars laying around. Mm -hmm. You know, give us a, a something we can work with to incentivize that business owner to get that money at least partially or start the payback so that it's doable and put a time limit on it so that if you don't do it by a certain deadline, I'm sorry, you had your chance. I've heard that they're talking about that, but we need something like that sooner than later if that's the case, because... Yeah. People are coming to us now. They're not going to, you know, yep. and, and by the time they come out with something a year from now, people are probably over it and they don't have less money to pay back than they would today. And they're not going to all of a sudden just go borrow it. It's just, it, it's a mess. And again, I keep reminding myself it was a pandemic. We did this in a hurry, but there's no, we're, there's no excuse today. Help us. Right. Right. Give us some tools and like, you know, and, and, and like you said, 
you know, come forward. There's no, if you come forward, there's no penalties. If you come forward, uh, cooperate with us on whoever did it and, and pay us the part you got. Um, and yeah, I, uh, because they've already said they can't audit themselves out of it. And yeah. when I heard that, you know, what's on the street now? Just Why not do it? It's a business risk. It's small business. And so there are people out there going, well, what do I have to lose? They can't audit themselves out. I might as well try it. Yeah, but I, you know how I feel about that, Larry. I, I am, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I just, I mean, we, you, we could say that about all tax returns. Right. But that's I mean, we have not such a low. We have, so, so if we want to talk about risk factor, let's remind all these small businesses that the, your risk of an ERC audit is substantially higher than any other audit. Yes. I mean, and and they will go. It won't. It will be. I believe, uh, Roger. I will be believe that it, it will be more than five percent. I I mean, it's going to be a large number that are going to get audited. And once they, I think, once they narrow down the firms, the abusing firms, then they might go in the back. You know, go into it that way. Um, but yeah. I do think that the whole system is a voluntary system, and if we if we break down this piece, I think you guys both referred to it, we just start crumbling away at the entire system, the entire yes. voluntary tax compliance structure, which is, which for those of us, I mean, I've been in the industry for 35 years. It's sad. It's, it's sad because there are, there's always people that are going to push the line or go over the line, but there's so many that really want to do the right thing. They want to pay their fair share, but they don't want to see the neighbor get 500,000 when they don't. Right. That's and, the tough one. And downstream, I think we've all been referring to, downstream, does this help to improve compliance or does this help downstream when that person goes, when that client you fire, they go to somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You're now, it's not just the compliance in ERC, but Rogers, you're referring. It's the whole tax system. And Kathy, I think that's where you're at here, that if we don't watch, it will crumble the whole system because you know it, it it's just no i'm um I, I we just we need some help we need some working tools um i'm i think i know a little bit about erc and when i navigate it i can't navigate it on irs.gov i i understand their scams that's the first thing i understand some of their common things but tell me something new Tell me the most common things, you know, tell me some of these things like gross receipts and then explain if it's partial shutdown and you're, and you're uh, essential, then it, what's more than nominal? I mean, that's been one of mine. If you just go to more than nominal, that one takes care of so many of the clients. And see, we've done a lot of ERC, but it's been in Illinois. Uh, it's been some like in Florida, California. It's been referrals from other practitioners. And and there are, you know, we've seen people qualify um, Chicago and L.A. There's some people there to qualify. They do qualify for all six quarters. Mm -hmm. So, no, we're not here to say, see, those need it and they should get it. Mm 